Okay, hello everyone. I want to uh, thank you all for joining us here today to, uh, on our session on green buildings and the built environment. Um, <clears throat> on behalf of GGGI, uh, I just want to thank you all for joining the session and taking time uh, to be with us. It's only through the participation and engagement of all of you that Global Green Growth Week is a success. So thank you. We're here today to talk about uh, green buildings. I think it's going to be a very exciting uh, discussion. Um, my, I'm Annika Peterson. I'm the country representative for GGGI in Mongolia. Uh, and my colleague Miguel will also co-facilitate this session today with me. Thanks, Miguel. <clears throat> um, I think the climate challenge for the building sector is very clear. On the one hand, buildings are responsible for 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And on the other hand, the location and quality of buildings uh, can mean life or death when disaster strikes. So it's a very important and timely topic. And I'm going to kick things off uh, today with um, a welcome address from GGGI's president and chair, uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished participants and guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome all of you to this year's Global Green Growth Week, organized by the Global Green Growth Institute. Your participation is evidence that we, the global community, demand climate action, and I want to thank you for doing your part to drive and empower green growth. The climate crisis is perhaps the defining crisis of our times. Every year, we can read and hear more and more about the devastating impacts of extreme weather systems. And this year is proving to be one of the worst years yet with the record floods, the droughts and the heat waves all of which lead to displacements from homes, food crises, and wildfires that disrupt and destroy the lives of millions. We are destroying our hope for a better future, and we need to work together to save our planet. I'm pleased to know that so many of you are coming together to exchange ideas, solutions, and best practices on how to advance the implementation of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, the framework which I helped establish during my time as a Secretary General of the United Nations. I'm especially pleased to know that many of you are joining from all corners of the world, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and the Pacific, and many of the solutions to be discussed are coming from women and indigenous communities who are most affected by climate change. I encourage you to take full advantage of Global Green Growth Week and engage with one another as green growth champions and practitioners. The climate crisis will require collaboration and collective action from each and every one of us because climate change knows no borders and climate change does not discriminate based on race or social class. We can transform our economies and societies and live a better future, a sustainable and inclusive future only if we work together. The challenges will be difficult and there are no shortcuts, but if we work together urgently, I think we can do it. As I have said before, there is no plan B 
because there is no planet B either. I hope you will join me to make the world a better place for future generations. I wish you very fruitful and successful events during Global Green Growth Week. Thank you. So I think, um, as always, our president and chair Ban Ki-moon's words are inspiring uh, to highlight the urgency of efforts to address climate change. And I think uh, it's great that we have a distinguished group of experts uh, and panelists and speakers uh, um, uh, to join us here today uh, to talk about how we can accelerate the transformation in the building sector. According to the International Energy Agency, in order to achieve net zero emissions and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, all the new buildings need to be zero carbon ready by 2030. That's uh, less than 10 years from now. And 50% of existing buildings need to be retrofitted to zero carbon ready by 2040. And by 2050, all buildings should be zero carbon ready. At the same time, on the adaptation and resilience side, in 2021 alone, climate-related disasters caused more than $280 billion in damages to buildings and infrastructure, and more than 10,000 lives were lost. And the numbers, as uh, our president and chair highlighted, continue to grow each year. So investing early to construct more resilient buildings in secure locations can save lives, minimize costs and protect the sustainable development gains that we've achieved so far. It's estimated that $1 invested in resilient buildings can save four in the future. So I'm delighted uh, to kick off our session by inviting Ms. Rowena Ramos uh, to give the keynote address. She is the vice chair of the Board of Trustees of the Philippines uh, Green Buildings Council. She's also an architect by trade uh, and works for Echo Tectonica, uh, an architectural co company there. Um, and she's an overall leader in the promotion of green buildings in, in the Philippines, but also globally. So we're gonna start with the keynote address from Ms. Rowena Ramos. And she'll also be, uh, she's online here uh, as well. So maybe we can, uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions and talk to her directly as well. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having us at the Philippine Green Building Council to share a message in today's session on green building built environment in Asia. Good morning. Thank you for having us at the Philippine Green Building Council to share a message in today's session on green building built environment in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you to the chair of the Global Green Growth Institute, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, and the leadership of the organization for having us in your celebration of the Global Green Growth Week. In the Philippines, every year we have been experiencing stronger typhoons and changing climates that are disproportionately affecting the different segments in our country. In 2021, Super Typhoon Odette affected 10.8 million people, hundreds of thousands displaced and damaged and destroyed 1.9 million houses. It highlighted the challenges with the immediate response to these catastrophes, particularly in the ability of our cities and municipalities in restoring power and water. The Philippines have been named in various sources as one of the countries that is most at risk and vulnerable to climate change and its negative impacts. We are both susceptible to the negative impacts, including the exposure to extreme weather events. In addition, we are also lagging in our readiness and capability to cope or adapt to climate change. 
Coastal communities are at higher risk, with 60% of LGUs in the provinces and major cities. The Climate Change Commission of the Philippines recognized the potential economic loss if there is disregard to climate change risk and productivity will decline due to climate-induced heat in workplaces. While some areas in our country are developed, developing areas in our country are having or will be having difficulties in addressing climate-related issues. The building sector is one of the major contributors to the growing climate crisis due to its contributions to global emissions. While our industry consumes one-third of the global energy, our impact to global emissions expands far from just our direct use of energy in our buildings. If the building and construction sector were to drastically shift demand towards low-carbon options, it will require a transformation in the processes of the supply chain. This would then affect the total emissions for the materials and service streams and will have an enormous impact on emissions mostly attributed to other sectors. The building industry influences a complex supply chain that affects our use of resources and generation of waste and GHGs. We have seen countless examples of how a single development created a big impact on the density in an area and influenced the need for additional infrastructure and resources to support these changes in the community. The total potential impact, therefore, of the buildings and construction sector is far greater than what it is directly responsible for. Globally, the World GBC serves as a global network that leads the transformation of the built environment to make it healthier and sustainable. World GBC has been creating global programs and supports the local country-level approach in promoting green building that is appropriate for each country member. Collectively, the National Green Building Councils in around 70 countries drive action to achieve these global goals and promote sustainable development. Each national GBC has been transforming their markets across different sectors towards a more sustainable built environment. The World GBC Network is organized across five regions around the world, Africa, the Americas, Asia Pacific, Europe, and the Middle East and North Africa. We believe green buildings is one of the best cross-cutting tools for climate action and in addressing various environmental, social, and economic goals. You'll see here an infographic from the World GBC on the Sustainable Development Goals or Global Goals that green buildings address for economies, for climate change, and for people. Within World GBC strategy of sustainable buildings, for everyone, everywhere. Our mission is to transform the building and construction sector across three strategic areas, climate action, health and well-being, and resources and circularity. In the region, the national GBC in the Asia-Pacific region, including the Phil GBC, have been focusing on programs that accelerates the adoption of net zero projects and the promotion of healthier buildings. While there are GBCs that are already experiencing circularity and have been incorporating these principles in their tools, more work still needs to be done to translate the global programs and objectives of the regional and national level. We are collectively advancing towards a net zero whole life carbon goal. Each national GBC that is part of the global ANZ program has been developing roadmaps to guide our respective countries towards decarbonization through appropriate solutions and strategies and accelerating the adoption of net zero targets at the project and organization levels. In the region, we are developing the Asia-Pacific Net Zero Readiness Framework to gauge and to eventually guide policymakers, project proponents, and end users in incorporating net zero in the respective jurisdictions of the national GBCs. We are also further exploring how individual regions are addressing embodied carbon in the built environment and how we can accelerate action in reducing embodied carbon. In addition to promoting better places for people, the World GBC aims to catalyze the change and equipping the industry with guidelines and tools to redefine the scope of health and well-being in the built environment. 
In the region, GBCs are developing educational programs, guidelines, and certification tools to empower project proponents and their stakeholders in addressing wider socioeconomic priorities for the built environment. Globally, we have been seeing the shift of how we design, construct, and operate our buildings with a particular focus on sustainability. Green buildings look at the holistic approach in ensuring our buildings are good for the planet, the profit of our businesses, and the people that are involved in the development or are the end users of these buildings. One of the major catalysts in this transformation is the use of building rating tools. One of the most notable programs of national GBCs all around the world are green building rating tools. By rewarding measurable improvements to a building's environmental performance, green building rating systems help create market incentives that are transforming building industry practices globally. For example, the Verde Green Building Rating System measures the performance of building projects above and beyond existing building and environmental laws, regulations, and mandatory standards. When a project uses the tool and undergoes the formal certification process, projects are awarded with a star rating equivalent to the weighting achieved by the project. You can compare this to how hospitality buildings are rated for the level of luxury. For Verde, we use the star rating to easily communicate with the general public the environmental performance of projects. The Philippine Green Building Council leads the action in greening our built environment in the Philippines. Our objective is to ensure that we have a sustainable environment where everyone can live, work, and play. The PhilGBC is an alliance of leaders with corporate members and partners in the building industry. We rate, educate, and advocate for green building in the country. We are focused on developing programs and tools to support green building projects, including capacity building and trainings, advocacy programs, with the national and local government and the assessment, certification, and rating of green building projects under the comprehensive tools developed and being administered by the PhilGBC. The comprehensive set of tools for project proponents are designed to help you in incorporating green building, health and well-being, and net zero principles when you design, construct, and operate your projects. We believe we can achieve our goals through a holistic approach in sustainability. We are continuously improving and administering the Verde Green Building Rating System under the current version of Verde Buildings. We also expanded the scope of the tool with the release of the first version of Verde Districts to measure, assess, rate, and certify community and campus-type projects above and beyond environmental and building laws, regulations, and mandatory standards. Aligned with the Global Net Zero Program, we are promoting Net Zero Energy through the Advancing Net Zero Philippines or ANZPH program. We encourage buildings to reduce their energy consumption through energy conservation and optimization strategies and use on-site or off-site renewable energy for the remaining operational energy demand of the project. The latest addition to the tools available in the country is the PhilGBC health and well-being for buildings. Project proponents may use the h and tool to plan and implement strategies that address environmental, economic, and social priorities that impact the health and well-being of your project team, your employees, and the end users of your building. One of the gaps that we are addressing is the need to connect projects with suppliers and service providers that share the same values in delivering their green building projects. Through the Green Building Procurement Hub, greenbuildingph.org, you may find the listing of green building products and services that may help you in the design, construction, and operations of your green, health and well-being, and net zero projects. Feature your work as leaders in our built environment. We have been seeing private companies and national and local governments undergoing bad certification for their projects. If this is an indication to the direction of the building industry, we are hopeful that we are seeing a positive direction towards a more sustainable built environment. Boutique commercial office developers and property managers are taking the lead in ensuring they deliver 
world-class buildings in the market. Top organizations in the industry have been placing sustainability and their best foot forward to meet their targets for their buildings and districts. Horizontal developers are also more engaged even for the affordable housing market. They also require expertise beyond the current business practice and require a green and health-focused outlook or net zero actions from their project team members and partners to achieve their net zero targets. If you're also interested in learning more about these tools and sharpen your knowledge on sustainability, you may contact the PhilGBC National Secretariat at secretariat at philgbc.org or verde at philgbc.org to learn how you can become a certified Verde professional, a NZPH accredited professional, or health and well-being accredited professional. The principles of sustainable development have been promoted for decades, with green buildings being one of the best cross-cutting tools for climate action and in addressing various environmental, social, and economic goals. We invite everyone to join us in the campaign for continuing transformation of our built environment, addressing and contributing to the sustainability and resiliency of economies, people, and the planet. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ramos, for the great presentation. I think it's a good way uh, to kick off the two panels that we have planned today. And um, I really appreciate the work uh, being done in the Philippines to present a holistic approach to green buildings that deals not only with climate change issues, but also um, supports and focuses on the health and well-being of people as the built environment and uh, uh, is a key determinant of many health and well-being outcomes, but also emphasizing circularity in the design, construction, and management of buildings. I think these three components are, are a good way to frame the discussions that we're planning to have today. So we're going to move uh, to the Asia panel, and we have three panelists here to talk uh, about uh, some of the work going on in Asia and globally. And I want to invite uh, my colleague, Mr. Tarandash, uh, to, to present. He's going to talk about experience in Mongolia, promoting green buildings. Uh, the work of uh, GIZ in Mongolia um, has been going on in this sector for some time. So um, thank you, Mr. Tsarandesh, for joining us. And the floor is yours. So thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you, Anaka. Yes, I can hear you. Introduction. So I will try to share my screen. Uh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. We have your presentation in case you need Okay, it. Uh, then uh, please then screen uh, my presentation. I will start from. Sorry, I did. It's okay. No problem. Um, we have uh, the slides here. We'll, we'll, we'll project them for you. Okay. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. so uh, hello to everyone and good morning uh, to all of you. And first of all, I would like to thank the GGI for inviting to this important event. And in my presentation, I would shortly introduce 
uh, GIZ project and about the green certification here in Mongolia. Uh, GIZ is working uh, in Mongolia in the field of energy efficiency since uh, 1995. Uh, in the meantime, implemented a numerous project with regard to energy generation and consumption, and as such became a really well-known institution in Mongolia. Regarding the cooperation between GGI and, and GIZ, uh, both institutions are now partnering uh, by the implementation of a new NAMA project funded by European NAMA facility. Uh, it's about uh, thermotechnical retrofitting of residential buildings with the aim to, uh, to establish a uh, funding mechanism uh, and uh, to, uh, to overcome, uh, in, in that way, to overcome obstacles with regard to financing of energy efficient and green buildings in Mongolia. So first, uh, next slide. So um, the project I'm presenting now is implemented in 1920, uh, 20, uh, 19, 20, 22, and it was funded by uh, German um, Federal Ministry, BNZ, and co-financed by STC. So it's, uh, uh, and you can see it's uh, quite very, uh, integrated has a very, very integrated approach with linkages to different levels uh, in, in uh, with regard the consultancy on policy level uh, the capacity building technology transfer uh, and etc please next slide so on this slide you see the uh, four project goals um, it's about good governance practices, uh, development of local energy efficiency, local energy efficiency action plan for capital city, uh, Ulaanbaatar. Uh, it's about capacity building and training, and lastly, about the introduction of new energy efficiency technologies uh, uh, through introduction, uh, through implementation of uh, retrofitting projects on public buildings such as school and kindergarten. Next slide, please. So now I would like to uh, present some results and impact of the project. So next slide. So here uh, you see, for instance, uh, 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 the results within the goal one. For instance, uh, the database for public building investments in the education sector has been established, allowing the transparent collection and prioritization of retrofitting requests. Next slide. Uh, within the goal two, uh, local and local energy efficiency action plan has been developed and submitted to UBCT. With this plan, uh, UBCT will get a uh, quite comprehensive investment roadmap to comply with its commitment to NDC with regard to emission reduction as well as air pollution reduction. This is still one of the big challenges facing uh, Ulaanbaatar city. Moreover, it, uh, in order to establish a sustainable financing mechanism, uh, different financial options have been uh, developed together with the banking sector. Next slide. This slide shows uh, some results achieved within the goal three. For instance, first uh, e-learning platform for the construction sector for energy efficient and green buildings uh, have been established, uh, uh, which is apt for different target groups. groups. And it, it, this platform, e-learning platform now being offered by the Mongolian Designers Association. Furthermore, uh, thanks to advisory services which we provided to Mongolian Ministry of Construction and Urban Development, uh, Green Building Council of Mongolia uh, has been established as an NGO recently. Uh, as an advisory body to MCUD, 
and others, it will play a key role for in the introduction of energy efficient green technologies in Mongolia, as well as for the introduction of green certification uh, in the um, uh, construction sector. Next slide. And lastly, within the goal for our, our 20 uh, public school and kindergarten buildings have been uh, retrofitted in energy efficiency manner. And here you can see some uh, results. It shows that beside the great improvement of the learning environment, uh, a considerable amount of heat energy and CO2 emissions uh, have been saved. In that way, we could extend the lifetime of the buildings. The project also clearly demonstrated that energy efficiency retrofitting is by far more cost efficient than the investment in construction of new buildings. Next slide. In framework of the project, uh, and a pilot project has been implemented in collaboration with the banking sector of Mongolia with the aim to create a, a, financial, a new finance scheme for energy efficient houses uh, to be built in Gert districts of UB city. Uh, Gert district, for your information, Gert districts are informal settlement, settlements in certain areas of UB city. And they are about, uh, and they live about 30% of residents of Ulaanbaatar city. Uh, this is the first financing scheme uh, with the energy efficiency criterion and energy auditing, auditing, which was tested and introduced in Mongolian uh, Mongolia, and is now adopted by the banking sector in the green uh, housing loan products. For instance, uh, the one criterion is requiring at least 20% energy efficiency. On the slide, you see uh, uh, different uh, energy efficiency houses which uh, were built within this pilot project. Next slide, please. So I would like to very shortly introduce the green certification uh, in Mongolia implemented within the project mentioned earlier. For the certification, next slide, for the certification uh, the edge system developed by International Finance Corporation was applied. Edge is in a green certification system, especially designed for developing countries. On the, on the slide, you see uh, the, 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 the first uh, energy efficient house, which, were, which was uh, assessed uh, using edge application. So the energy auditing situation took place for this house took place in 2021 for duration of five months. There are two types of certi certificates. Premil uh, next slide. Uh, uh, prelimin preliminary certificate in the, which is for the designing stage and final level for the finishing finished building. In our case, we used finished building for, to get this uh, edge cert certificate. So on this slide, you see the uh, four, uh, three steps for the certification, starting with the using of age up application and the ending in final certification. So next slide. On, on this slide, you see this uh, on-site audit, which was uh, at that time due to uh, COVID restrictions conducted remotely. So in total, uh, in total, uh, 19 measures have been checked and uh, confirmed. And Sintali, Sintali LLC, an international authorized company, carried out the energy audit and final certification. Next slide. So and here you see this uh, certificate. We, uh, we due to the grid energy performance of the uh, house, uh, the advanced certificate has been issued uh, with energy efficiency of uh, 57%. So next slide. And finally, uh, to encourage the achievement and for the evidence raising, 
purposes, a small event has been organized to hand over the certificate to the construction company and to the, to the house owners. That's from my side. Thank you for your attention. Sandesh, thank you for sharing uh, Mongolia's experience. We'll have uh, time after the other presenters uh, for some Q&A, hopefully, but really appreciate um, the presentation and the work that GIZ has done on capacity building and setting up the framework, but also actually retrofitting uh, old buildings and building new green buildings. So um, thank you for that. I'm going to hand over now to the next presenter, uh, Mr. Pablo Sassoon. He's an intern at GGGI, and he's been working on developing a database, uh, a buildings uh, database. Uh, so he's going to share with us uh, his work. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Anika. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity of presenting uh, these interesting projects we've been working at. Um, so uh, this is uh, the idea of this database uh, is that it will be a unified database with all the information available on uh, green buildings and sustainable construction uh, for the different uh, country members of GGGI. Uh, here uh, we are seeing on my screen uh, all the different uh, regions that GGI is working all over the world uh, with all the different uh, countries uh, in the, the rows and in the columns, all the different uh, variables that we thought they would be interesting uh, for anyone uh, developing a project on green buildings uh, to have access to, uh, because we understood that the information uh, is very disseminated uh, online and that there is no unified um, database to uh, access all this information. So uh, going through a bit the database, um, here we have the example of Cambodia. Uh, the first question that we ask if, is if there are building codes existent. Uh, we distinguish between national building code that is in red, uh, energy efficiency code that is in light blue, and green building code that is in green. Uh, so here we uh, we can see if there are uh, all of these resources for each country and also if they're mandatory or not. And here on notes and building codes, uh, uh, we, we put all the information available, uh, distinguishing between these three different uh, categories. Uh, these are very different uh, information uh, tools that uh, we found online. Um, they're direct links directly to the building codes um, on or relevant uh, official governmental information on uh, GGGI projects or on different uh, organizations that are promoting uh, energy efficiency, for example, uh, in uh, these countries. Also, um, we wanted to uh, see if uh, there are uh, certified uh, buildings and which kind of certification they are using for each country. Um, and so we listed the, uh, this uh, information. Uh, for some countries, uh, we did some uh, brief details on uh, which are these um, uh, projects about. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, these cert certified projects can be inspiration for new projects uh, that can learn from best practices. Uh, also, uh, another important information, if there is a Green Building Council or not, uh, for and also a direct link for each one of, uh, of the Green Building Councils. And uh, also, um, we analyzed the um, uh, NDCs for each country. Um, these are, uh, for the moment, uh, country members of GGGI. Uh, we distinguished between uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, measures that are um, considered within the NDCs. And uh, I put here in, um, uh, in a special mark on uh, which are the different um, focuses uh, for uh, both mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and uh, it is detailed where within the NDC it is. So um, 
uh, you can access um, hopefully in the future when this is published and this is available information. Um, you can uh, access this information easily. Uh, and last thing um, is uh, construction waste considered yes or no? Um, because uh, we also consider this is a very important and critical point for green buildings. Um, so um, uh, let me check here. Um, I what else I wanted to share with you? I, I um, the idea of this started as a blank spreadsheet, and now it is a uh, completed uh, with all the information uh, you could find online. Uh, this needs to be cross-checked with the country teams uh, to understand if they have different uh, information than the one that is uh, uh, put here in the database. Uh, uh, be, uh, before uh, making uh, further steps that can, could also be uh, analyzing this information, understanding um, uh, statistics and uh, more uh, quantitative analysis for each one of the regions, uh, if they a percentage for um, presence of uh, energy efficiency code, for example, and um, uh, for the uh, for developing this database, uh, we used uh, search engines, uh, engines, and um, different other projects, just uh, such as uh, GBIG, uh, that is uh, also working with um, certification for buildings and the um, status report for the UN. And the last thing I uh, I wanted to, to say is ask uh, for uh, feedback on how to make this um, database more useful uh, to you, uh, to everyone developing projects uh, in green buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo, for sharing this uh, work that you've been doing over the past months. I think it has the potential to be a useful resource, not only for uh, staff of GGGI, but potentially for people outside GGGI. So I would encourage all of you to post questions or suggestions or feedback uh, to Pablo on the message board as well. Um, and we can engage in a discussion uh, in writing while, while the presentations continue as well. So thank you, Pablo. Next, I want to invite uh, Liesl to, to present. Um, Liesl is uh, uh, coming from Adam Smith International, but she's working uh, on a, a buildings program. So I think she'll introduce the program uh, to you herself, but I want to welcome her uh, and, and uh, give her the floor as well. Lisa, you're on mute, if you don't know that. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> I hope the picture is clear as well now, the presentation. Yeah, everything looks good. Thank you. OK, great. Um, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Annika, and thanks uh, to my fellow panel members uh, for, for setting the scene there. Uh, it's great to be sharing with you all today. My name is Liesl Keem. I'm the climate change lead on a program called Partnerships for Infrastructure, and I'm going to be talking today at a higher level, uh, less specific to um, building construction and codes um, and more looking at uh, our approach to designing green infrastructure uh, in general and how we can move from a compliance-based mindset to something more transformative. Just going to start a little timer here so I don't run over. So, okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, Partnerships for Infrastructure is an Australian government initiative partnering within Southeast Asia to deliver sustainable, inclusive and resilient growth through quality infrastructure. We work across countries in Southeast Asia uh, and have a number of different uh, sectors, trans um, infrastructure sectors that we work on, uh, built infrastructure primarily. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the program today. If you would like any additional information, please reach out to me. There's much more um, I, can, I can talk about there. 
Today I'm going to talk about three elements of delivering green infrastructure. Um, this is really from the practitioner perspective uh, and my experience implementing climate change considerations across infrastructure programs and investment portfolios. Um, so there are three important things that I'm going to touch on today. One is setting the right ambition. Uh, so setting ambition and creating opportunities to deliver a more advanced agenda in this space early. Responding comprehensively, so leveraging our new understanding of where vulnerabilities sit and what creates resilience to shape a more comprehensive and dynamic response than perhaps we've used traditionally, um, and using the right tools, leveraging existing tools for better design and decision making. We often find, I often encounter um, investors who want green infrastructure, they want an, a green infrastructure stream, um, but they're not sure what that means. They're putting out TORs that are the business as usual TORs, um, but just changing the wording to green infrastructure, right? But there's actually tools that we can use that make this so much easier. So just to start, I'm going to touch on uh, moving beyond compliance. So what's on the screen here is a classification system that we use internally on partnerships for infrastructure to look at our disaster risk reduction and climate change ambition on projects. And this is just a nice conceptualization of this journey. So moving from on the left, the do no harm compliance mindset. This is where we've been for a long time. Activity is driven through um, safeguards, standards, ESAAs and, and regulatory requirements. This is the absolute minimum that we have to do um, on every activity. And then we transition into this space in which I feel like the industry uh, has made some progress in this transition now. We're getting quite good at making sure that the infrastructure that we design and plan for, we are better at making sure we take into account how that particular activity can be made resilient to current and future projected climate and disaster impacts. And there's a lot of um, procedures there. It's embedded with a number of organizations. We're getting better at that, but it's still not a default. Then there's space and opportunity to transition to a more transformative approach and lens and where we don't just do the thing that we're doing, the infrastructure that we're doing well in respect to climate change and disaster, but we actually look at how we can use that infrastructure to build resilience to uh, climate change and disasters. So looking at deliberately designed and delivered infrastructure that addresses climate change and disaster risks. So we can't necessarily be in that space for everything that we do, but we find it quite useful to be able to classify and assign the relevant tools and resources um, to delivering wherever on that continuum we are targeting. My second uh, point here is about responding comprehensively, point two. Uh, we have a lot of work that's been done over the last five to 10 years on understanding risks and uh, conceptualizing how we can understand and respond to those risks. The IPCC has a risk definition has been in use for about five years or so, but we're still encountering in the industry people um, transferring an old um, likelihood consequences a version of risk classification from other sectors transferring that to this sector and whilst it works to some extent um, the the analysis and the, the sector has moved beyond that so now we're looking at uh, this more comprehensive approach to vulnerability and exposure the new climate resilient development framework outlined in the recent ar6 ipcc report if you haven't checked it out has a really interesting framework to link this climate hazard, vulnerability and exposure with ecosystems and human society. So understanding coupled systems there and how what's happening in those systems can impact the risk profile in these other spaces. So overall, whereas we might have traditionally looked at an asset or a project, a built asset uh, in understanding climate impacts, now we have to think more systemically about what is happening so that our ad adaptation responses can address um, the real issues. An interesting example that I wanted to share here of an approach that has delivered this comprehensive response is the sustainable livelihoods approach that was utilized on a project funded by the Asian Development Bank and delivered by Mott MacDonald. Uh, this climate resilient livelihood improvement and watershed management in the CHT 
project design phase was use the livelihoods approach to understand different types of capital at a community and social level, human capital, natural capital, financial capital, social capital, and physical capital, and looked at how those different types of capital and how they functioned um, created vulnerability in, in the context for those communities and link that to livelihoods. And then again, how changes in livelihoods could reduce that vulnerability and create resilience. So using this approach as the basis for the design and conceptualization of interventions allowed us to push ahead with interventions targeting integrated watershed management, access to value chains, community infrastructure, rural roads and skills and training. Uh, but it meant that the responses that that process of having a response that uh, having an intervention an infrastructure intervention that responded to a vulnerability was much easier we didn't have to retrospectively try and think and understand vulnerability it became part of the process to develop well tailored responses so for example our rural roads we don't just think about um, the, how their risk profile associated with increasing landslide risk and damage that can do but we actually think about their value in terms of providing connectivity to communities in times of shock uh, and, and looking at where's the gap in terms of last mile connectivity maybe between two villages um, that can also help build resilience of those communities. Uh, so a really useful tool applied there to give a wider and more comprehensive lens in, in planning for infrastructure. My final point was on using the right tools. Uh, there's a lot of information on this slide, which I don't really have uh, time to go through, but I wanted to make the point that depending on your purpose around appraising, um, managing emissions or looking at designing around vulnerability or delivering resilience in your infrastructure, there are a number of tools out there and we're not starting from scratch here and these tools, they're changing daily, you know, on the physical and transition risk assessment side, um, we have solid methodologies, we have the ISO 1400 series on climate adaptation and response, we have, um, I've referenced the ADB, CRVA tools, uh, which we used on the Bangladesh project, but, you know, a lot of institutions have developed very comprehensive tools here, very explicit methodologies, the UNDP, New Climate Change and Disaster Risk Standard laying out an agenda there. Then we have new tools, for example, the Physical Climate Risk Assessment methodology released by the Climate Coalition for Climate Resilient Infrastructure, tools which are very explicit methodologies for incorporating climate risk into your financial analysis of a project, bankability studies and optioneering. Uh, and there's also UNEPFI climate risk tool landscape, which maps out you know, all of the tools that, that are available. Um, in the emission side, we have past 2080, science-based targets, climate bonds and others, all laying out methodologies for appraisals and ways to carry them out so that you can understand these drivers. The resilience rating system by the World Bank is a really good way to look at how you're delivering resilience early upstream so that that more transformational space um, and the new EU Green Taxonomy has two annexes which outline they are the most detailed specifications I've seen of what a positive outcome looks like in climate change adaptation and mitigation for 70 plus sectors. Uh, so not just how do we not do anything bad in this space, but how do we actually deliver something good on everything that we do in every sector. And when you're using these tools, you get a range of outputs, very specific, that can feed into your planning process, um, very explicit outputs. So key message here, there's a lot of very specific tools and they're ready to use. And by using the right specialization, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Find the people who are doing this now. With a month of their time, you can do something very interesting in this space, yeah, to, to really change uh, the, your approach to infrastructure running out of time, but I just wanted to flash up uh, this slide uh, because all these things I'm talking about today will deliver 
better infrastructure outcomes and more green infrastructure outcomes. Um, however, they also intrinsically allow us to align and tap into the climate finance flows with 632 billion annual average of flows in this space. You know, that's a real value add there. And when we're working uh, with partner governments um, or our own governments, we're delivering a real value add if we're allowing them to access this finance or aligning to this finance so that downstream capitalization of infrastructure projects is, is easier and there's more opportunities open there. On that, I'll pause. Uh, thank you very much for your time and looking forward to any questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Liesl. Uh, really great uh, to have you as a speaker and also uh, I think took note of the continuum of types of infrastructure and, you know, I think one of the questions so one of the panelists was also about how to make improvements over time from sort of minimal requirements to being really transformational in, in the design of our infrastructure. So thank you for that. I want to raise one question. We're running a little bit out of time, uh, but I wanted to pose one question and, and ask Ms. Ramos uh, first uh, to address this question, but then if anyone else wants to uh, add, we can also uh, provide a little bit of time for that or, or move the discussion to the chat as well. Um, Ms. Ramos, there's often an implementation or enforcement gap in the design and development of green buildings and green infrastructure. There are good standards and regulations in place, but they aren't implemented or enforced. And I think the green buildings standards that have been put in place are one example of a positive incentive to go green. Uh, but what more can we do to accelerate this transition to green climate resilient buildings? Are there any other examples or recommendations you have, especially since you come from the private sector, um, about uh, things that we can put in place to incentivize uh, this transition and speed it up? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Anaka, for that question. In terms of incentives, in the country, it varies. So it would depend at the local level or at the national level. But what we are happy about in the country is that the initiatives are really coming from the private sector. So when we started with the launch of the rating tools in the country, particularly Verde, it is designed to be a voluntary rating system and it is recognized by the Department of Energy. So it is a, an arm from the, from the government sector. All throughout the benefits of going for green building is being felt already. That's why the there is not there is the the want to have initiatives and to have initiatives and incentives. But what we are experiencing now is the uptake of green buildings due to the interest and commitment of the private sector and also coming in are also projects from the government sector so in terms of of initiatives this is be, of incentives this is being discussed both at the local level and also being brought up to the national level in the government Thank you, Ms. Ramos. I think uh, this is also great that the private sector sees a benefit uh, itself, right, and, and is making the decision themselves to invest in green, more climate resilient buildings. So that's great. Um, I don't mean to cut the discussion short, but we do need to hand over to our Pacific colleagues and there will be more time at the end for additional q and I hope, but I'm also happy to engage in the chat and, and discuss some of these important issues that all of you ha have raised. So thank you everyone again for joining us, especially you, uh, Ms. Ramos, we appreciate your keynote address as well. So I'm gonna hand over now to Miguel and he's gonna start the Pacific uh, section of our, our the green buildings uh, discussion today. Thank you, Anaka. Can you all hear me well? Yes. Okay. Welcome everyone to the second panel about climate change and built environment in the Pacific. My name is Miguel Londoño and I'm the LCRD program manager for the Pacific region at GGGI and I will be co-facilitating this part of the event. 
Similarly, as in Asia, in the Pacific, green and resilient buildings present a great opportunity for Pacific Island countries to adapt and mitigate climate change. Therefore, at GGGI, we have partnered with, uh, uh, in Fiji with New Zealand, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Meteorological Services of the Fijian government to support the ongoing review of the building code in order to enhance the key elements uh, such as resource efficiency and resilience. Also, we are providing training and implementation tools for industry stakeholders and regulators to advance on the implementation of these measures in the field. Today, we have a rich uh, and diverse panel composed by a virtuous combination of development partners, uh, government allies, and the private sector to reflect in an, inter uh, in an inter integrative manner around regional challenges and opportunities in the Pacific, as well as views on improved regulations and the role and the needs of the private sector. Our panelists will deliver short presentations followed by an interactive discussion after which we will proceed to close the event. So um, we will initiate uh, our panel today with uh, Timothy Stats. He's a technical assistance officer uh, in, based in Fiji for the Pacific Regional Infrastructure Facility. Um, Tim has uh, expertise on design and construction focused on Asia Pacific area and specializes in the delivery of resilient infrastructure. As Pacific Regional Infrastructure Facility Technical Officer, he's responsible for formulating and managing the implementation of technical assistance activities delivered by PRAFCO and liaising with partners, regional organizations and the Fiji government. So Tim is gonna give us a, a regional picture of uh, the green buildings in the Pacific. Uh, the floor is yours, Tim, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Miguel. Uh, let me share my screen. So the uh, Pacific Region Infrastructure Facility or PRIF is a multi-development partner coordination and technical assistance facility for better infrastructure in the Pacific. You can see our uh, eight development partners, their logos on the bottom of the screen there. Um, so PRIF is currently working to improve coordination related to national building codes and standards across 13 Pacific Island countries, uh, where there's uh, many challenges in terms of having adequate codes and standards uh, and challenges in the application and enforcement of these that contribute to poor built environment outcomes. These vary according to each context, of course. Uh, however, relating to green building or climate uh, impacts, we know that the Pacific is frequently impacted by natural disasters and the inadequate resilience of buildings and infrastructure to withstand the effects contributes to the need for infrastructure to be rebuilt or repaired. Uh, which consumes additional energy and materials. So in order to consume less and save lives, I should add, buildings need to be designed and built to be resilient. Uh, also, inappropriate technologies and materials, building designs and materials that work in temperate zones around the world have been imported into urban areas in the Pacific with little adapt adaption to the climate. Uh, additionally, there are difficulties in maintaining and repairing infrastructure when it's been built to different standards or using imported technology, which cannot be serviced locally. So that also contributes to higher life cycle costs and poorer performance. And then inherent in the geography of the Pacific, as we know, we have small domestic economies spread over a very large ocean. So with 13 different systems of planning and building regulations for less than 3 million people, inter-island operability and exchange uh, is a continual challenge. Um, and then lastly, the other one that I note here, and there's many more, but inefficient design systems, I'm thinking about heating, cooling and sanitation, uh, obviously add to energy consumption, running costs and uh, lead to higher carbon footprints contributing to global climate change concerns. Uh, there's a number of opportunities um, and first amongst them, we're aware that there are many great initiatives, um, many of them supported by the PRIF development partners um, and they are recently completed or ongoing that are aimed at improving building codes and standards, uh, including improving the energy efficiency of buildings. And so with approximately 70% of the provisions of national building codes common across the different Pacific Island countries, there's enormous potential to leverage the lessons learned in one location to assist 
uh, increase the quality and efficiency of related work across the region. That's the first opportunity. And then secondly, most of the codes in the Pacific reference combination of Australian and New Zealand standards. Uh, of course, in the Northern Pacific, the compact countries often reference ICC standards. So whilst there's been a number of, a small number of Pacific specific standards, uh, particularly in Fiji, the opportunity exists to develop additional standards or specifications that allow greater utilization of local alternative materials and techniques that would lower carbon footprints, uh, fostering identities or preserving heritage and generating employment and financial returns for local economies. Um, Proof is, uh, has a, uh, uh, a piece of technical assistance that we're currently undertaking. It's called Improving National Building Codes and Standards in the Pacific. Uh, it builds on an earlier piece of work that was completed a number of years back and is uh, available to download from, from our website. This second piece of work, follow-on piece of work, has two objectives. At the regional level is to support the sharing of best practice, to leverage lessons learned and provide general coordination services, to support related initiatives, in the member countries and partners. And then secondly, providing direct support to three Pacific Island countries and improving, revising or drafting a new MBC in the example of Nauru. Um, uh, on the right there, you can see a quick snapshot of, um, as similar to it, <laughs> that's very simplified version of perhaps what Pablo was showing earlier. Um, but uh, the, 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 uh, the key takeaway is that it, it's a different setup in, in every, uh, uh, country across the Pacific. Um, so, and the, here is, a, I guess, a more detailed summary on the right. Um, uh, you can see this is also looks at the structure of the uh, national building codes across the Pacific. And as I said, there's many similarities there. Um, the Northern Pacific are over on the right here, the Southern and Central Pacific countries here. And most of the codes go back to the 1990s uh, to this Pacific Building Standards Project. Uh, I should also add home building, building manuals, a very important uh, um, supplementary documents to those national building codes. They essentially assist people build their own home in compliance with the code. Um, so ongoing at the moment in the Cook Islands, um, it's, their code has recently been updated. It's in the process of being legislated in Kiribati. It received a recent update. Uh, Kiribati, Niue, Tonga and Vanuatu have all had recent work done. Um, and then at the moment, uh, I'll leave the Fiji code here in the middle for um, Director Penne to talk about uh, after this. Uh, but uh, ongoing here, we have the Solomon Islands Building Code, which is nearing completion, supported by DFAT. We have the Tuvalu Building Code uh, with the assistance of the World Bank and now Nauru, um, is uh, a new code is being drafted with uh, direct support from Proof. Um, I won't read out the dot points on the left, but that's the basic uh, uh, aim of the coordination and harmonisation of the of the uh, of the Proof work. This is my last slide, and this is from the consultation with Pacific Island country governments. Um, uh, their views on on the effectiveness. Um, of their codes as they relate to energy efficiency and climate change. You can see there's mixed reviews, whether it uh, integrates climate change mitigation and adaption measures, for example, uh, moving on to, to save time. Um, coordination and harmonization, you can see that there is strong support there for um, this to be done in a more coordinated way, perhaps by a regional organization with Pacific Island design criteria and reference standards for the building construction industry or key reference standards, for example, standards for native timbers, bamboos in domestic construction or thatch for roof materials um, to be harmonized. And then finally, uh, but by no means least importance, perhaps it's the most, the enforcement and compliance. You can see here that there is a quite a, a range of views, but there's a, a lot of strongly disagrees whether the local governments um, have the uh, capacity, have the building inspectors, um, have the resources to uh, inspect, to update the codes and to administer their own codes. Um, this is obviously a key part, regardless of how well the building code or the home building manual is written, it needs to be understood by the private sector, it needs to be applied in their work, um, and it needs to be able to be enforced by the, by the national authorities for it to have any uh, measure of success. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for 
uh, this overview of the regional status in the Pacific. Now we're going to zoom in to the Solomon Islands. And I would like to invite um, Flori Gatu. Um, she is a, a member of the Construction Project Delivery Consultants, the associate group. And she's working on various projects with Ministry of Education, Fisheries, and, and others. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to uh, encourage all attendees to please use the Q&A. Uh, since we are short of time, I'd like to encourage everyone to type in your questions and whom are you targeting for the questions, or you can get the answers from presenters. Uh, so, um, Flori, are you online? Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Miguel. And I need to share my screen, right? Yes, please. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Um, thank you to uh, GGI. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to come on um, this platform and, and, and share with you all. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. And I'm just going to share about the observation on the relevance of green buildings in, in Solomon Islands and also the challenges um, and, and um, the incentives or, uh, that can, can um, um, help us to, to go uh, uh, green. So in the observations, um, you, we've been doing projects mainly for donor. Uh, uh, donor projects for such as schools and, um, and public buildings. And all the designs and construction materials compose of mostly 99% of imported uh, materials from overseas. Um, the local materials, which is usually um, timber, which is um, not treated, sand, gravel are often um, harvested unsustainably. Um, uh, we have um, the influences on the client uh, on, on whether to do a green building or, uh, or go with the conventional is very minimal. Uh, different, this is because um, different sectors are yet to adequately reflect green buildings and going green in their policies and agendas. And also we are working on the National Building Code, which is in draft. This is the uh, latest one, National Building Code 2022, um, that we are working on and it's nearly completed. It hasn't been legislated yet, as yet we are hoping to go to parliament in November. And, um, but again, in that National Building Code, uh, there is uh, no, uh, green building uh, compliance section in there. So it's still in its development and we're hoping that this would be the next phase of this building code. Uh, going forward, all is not doom. Uh, it is not mandatory that uh, donor projects uh, confer to climate uh, change designs and resilience. So we are hopeful that uh, they will drive that, including the private sector who is going to uh, mainly deliver the, the, those projects through uh, Contract uh, construction contracts and uh, and uh, fake parts and all that. So green building and client develop motivators um, here in the Solomon's. I think the moti mo the main motivational uh, uh, motivator would be uh, lower construction cost in terms of materials. Uh, again, materials that are. Uh, comply with uh, green building uh, not readily available and locally available and therefore um, it's very difficult to to have designs and 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 keep to a budget or um, have it affordable to the uh, 
local developers or clients uh, in the Solomons. Um, it's usually also because you have to bring it overseas, you have to have um, higher logistic costs and all that. So it 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 adds up to the to the total cost of um, uh, the building itself. Uh, we are also um, maintenance is a is a great is is a big issue here and and and. Uh, if we can maintain buildings and, and have replacement costs and solutions that are readily available and are available locally, uh, that would be a motivator for, uh, for us going green uh, and developing green buildings. Other requirements also includes um, steady and consistent supply of affordable electricity, and therefore it also contributes to this uh, um, costs to build. So all this you can see is all related to, to cost and availability um, of uh, materials. S materials. Now for, um, for some incentives um, from the government to the pr private sector, there has been a study uh, done in 2020 where there is a private sector mapping uh, to look at short-term goals, short to medium-term goals, uh, long-term goals uh, in the private sector. Um, again, uh, for short-term goals, it's in the Solomons, we have this government policy that uh, you, you cannot have your uh, self-generation and, and install power uh, solar pa panels uh, to for electricity, you cannot do that. It, 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 it attracts fees and charges that are very, very expensive. And therefore there is no um, incentive um, uh, for people to generate their own power and go and, and also uh, give it back to the grid. So that would be a, um, an, an incentive if the government is to change that policy. Uh, again, in the private sector, we're always looking for immediate, immediate, and that's like financing, uh, climate change, uh, action financing, uh, uh, tax, say tax rebate for businesses or developer homeowners uh, during the transition. So again, that all relates back to the financing itself. Um, it's all about the money uh, in, in, in Solomon Islands. And because it's such, it's so small that it's it's hard to we do we we do not um, pr produce a lot of materials locally and that so we rely a lot on um, on overseas um, uh, um, materials and um, to build our um, uh, our houses and our, our and do our developments with. Um, in the long term, um, I think investments should be uh, into. Uh, research of uh, local materials, local traditional knowledge towards uh, nature-based based solutions. We now realize that we do have a lot of, um, we have a lot of materials with a lot of, uh, um, we have a lot of resources that can be developed, can be developed if there's more research uh, um, put into it. Uh, say, for example, the use of bamboos, it's everywhere, the use of, um, other uh, locally based um, materials that, that can be um, used for for buildings. Um, the other one would be providing training on uh, sustainability and green building management of uh, priority projects. And I think the main, the last but not the least is alignment and translation of government policies. This is like the government would have a policy which is top down and again, business and the community, um, which is at the bottom that needs to sort of align and 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 therefore can um, can 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 actually work in um, in delivering green green uh, building in green buildings. So I think um, that's all I, I have on my slides. Um, that's a bit short, but I can take questions and I can uh, I'm happy to discuss. Um, after this. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Flori. Great. Um, so thank you for, for showing us the, the key uh, local context in the Solomon Islands. Um, I would like now, given that we're short of time, our last presenter, 
Mr. Andrew Penny and, and GGGI is uh, uh, Green Buildings Champion in 3G. Uh, Director Penny, are you online? The, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, Miguel, thank you for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, I've asked if someone can help me with the... Um, yes, the slides are, are presented now. Please um, good afternoon from Fiji. Um, the topic that I was asked to talk on was um, the building code and what is coming in it. Um, so if I was to ask to just move on to the second slide. Right, our, our background with the Fiji building code um, is that um, the original document that we have at the moment was prepared in 1990. And um, that was after a couple of hurricanes uh, required that we upgrade the quality of our buildings. Uh, it was legislated in uh, 2004 under the Ministry of Health. And then the current review in 2022 is expected to be completed next year. And again, this has come around following um, drastic effects of uh, stronger hurricanes uh, in the area. The uh, areas that will be developed in the code are highlighted in section 2.2 .2 on the slide. Um, these, these are where the significant the items in red are the areas that will have significant uh, improvements um, that has come to our notice as lacking in the current code. If we can go over to the next slide, please. Those identified in red in the previous slide are summarized here on this slide um, in the, under stronger wind and earthquake loading requirements. As I mentioned earlier, every, uh, currently the cyclones are getting stronger. When the previous code was done, the, um, the frequent size of the cyclones at that time was around Cat 3. And so at the moment, um, we are getting more frequent Cat 5 and uh, anticipated uh, future increases in the frequency of such winds. And so our building code is being upgraded to a Cat 5 level. The implications of that in cost um, being accommodated so that in the in, in, in the sense that uh, important public buildings and classrooms and places where gatherings are going to be held will have to be cut five. And if it's too expensive, uh, there will be allowances for uh, smaller uninhabited buildings and outhouses and uh, so forth to be at the cat three levels that they are now. But definitely prepared is for uh, safer and more reliable water quality, uh, water supply, and also the better quality of the effluent discharges uh, on the sanitation side, particularly with the more frequent flooding and how it affects uh, soakage pits and effluent treatments. The third item that uh, is being emphasized in the re renewed building code is under the topic of energy efficiency and sustainability, where we're trying to um, match up with the need to be at net zero carbon uh, by 2050. And so Fiji is a strong um, supporter for the global targets, um, net zero targets. And so we're using the building code to legislate the, um, the requirements, the um, carbon footprint requirements, so it's easier to implement in the community uh, when we go into construction. The fourth one is, of course, rising sea levels and flood levels. Uh, and this involves us um, trying to improve our flood mapping. Um, I think we've we've lost Director Penny. Perhaps this is connection. So 
Director Bennett, can you perhaps turn off the video uh, to save some bandwidth? We're having some connection issues. Uh, th thank you for that. Director Bennett, are you still online or did we lose you? Okay, I, I think we lost Director Penny. Okay, now we have six more minutes to finalize. So I think, uh, unfortunately, we would have to wrap up abruptly here. Um, but I do encourage, again, every attendee to uh, please use the Q&A. Uh, so you, your question- That was the last of the slides. Uh, okay, thank you, Director Penny. Thank you so much. Um, so, Anaka, thank I you, everyone. I will I will refer back to you um, to to wrap up the session. Uh, you're mute, Anaka. Pushing too many buttons. <laughs> thank you, Miguel, and thanks again to all the speakers. Uh, and participants. I think there were lots of important issues that were raised, but also really good efforts underway in many of the countries as well. And so having this space to uh, exchange what we're all doing in different countries to establish standards, um, to innovate with new designs, um, to provide innovative sources of financing, uh, all of these things, I think it's great to have a platform like this where we can exchange ideas. And I'm sorry we didn't have more time for discussion. I think it's always uh, the case here in these events where we try to pack so many things in. Um, but please feel free um, to reach out to all of us uh, here at GGGI um, to, to talk about any of the issues that were raised here. I think for GGGI, green buildings and industry is obviously uh, one of our key global priorities. Um, and so we have we will continue to to work in this area for for years to come uh, in the coming years i know we have some uh growing work in this area continuing uh, to provide uh, technical assistance and capacity building support around building codes um, looking at um, how to engage the private sector through escos uh, to be more engaged in green building and energy efficiency and all not only the buildings themselves but all the um, um, appliances and equipment and services that are required uh, to make buildings operational as well um, I I I um, wanted to give a chance uh, for my colleague uh, from our community of practice here uh, at GGGI uh, and the Asia regional lead in our community practice for green buildings to make a few uh, remarks. So I'm gonna hand over to Sumia, but I just, before I, I, giving him the floor, I wanna thank everyone again for joining. Um, thanks to all the presenters and speakers, I really, uh, appreciate your interventions and thoughtful inputs. So thank you. Sumya? Thank you, Anaka. Good morning, everyone. And uh, what a marvelous and fantastic presentations, uh, discussions by all the panelists. Uh, uh, I mean, all the points have been already covered. And uh, as we know, this uh, the building sector, which is uh, a very priority sector identified by various countries in their NDC goals. And this is going to play a very, very uh, important uh, uh, thing in the next years to come. And uh, the discussions also happened on many various areas, particularly uh, the technical things, starting from the building materials, the architecture, the design, the energy efficiency at the user point and all. And all. So these are going to happen uh, in, in a much rigorous way, the way we go ahead. But more important thing is the energy efficiency linking with the renewable energy that will be very, very critical thing to achieve. As we say that about 25 to 30% of the energy saving could be possible by various options with the low cost options, 
But what we intend to do it is that uh, innovative financing mechanism and how the investors are going to come forward because as we know, the more and more building related projects uh, are going to happen and the investment is going to play a major role. So whether the government is putting money in that or some private sectors or public private partnership are going to do that, that is the key question to be asked. We have seen the ESCO mechanisms in various countries, including my country here in India, has been quite successful, and but that needs to be propagated, replicated in other countries as well. Just to summarize, my last point is that once we go ahead in this particularly building and infrastructure sector, the cooling and the heating aspects that is going to play a majority of the, uh, I mean, very important role to um, uh, address upon. And uh, as we see in India, also we have a, you know, you know Indian cooling action plan, which categorically says about some cross-cutting technologies like district heating or cooling systems, maybe the tri-generation system, the super efficient air conditioning system, these are going to be, you know, major game changer in going uh, way forward. And Triple J as an international organization will continue to thrive, strive, it's a uh, thrive, it's uh, intent uh, to, to support to government in various uh, technical assistance programs, bringing national, uh, you know, I mean, uh, designing the national program so it can really transform the market in a much better way. And uh, we, as a community of practice here in Triple J, will be, very happy to get engaged with all the uh, all you people and all the you know political partners in the country uh, countries to take this forward and thank you very much for this opportunity to summarize these things and looking forward a fruitful engagement in the coming years thank you thank you Anna and Paul. Thank you. Uh, we're one minute over time, so I'll just say goodbye again to everyone and thank you. Um, there'll be some follow up and where you can share feedback. Um, so thanks again for joining us and have a good day, everyone.